much. Thank you, Molly, and uh, appreciate uh, all of you coming out today. I've, uh, this report is a quite interesting one, and it is spectacularly well-timed, uh, how it was that the uh, Center for Global Development uh, managed to arrange the bin Laden raid just ahead of the release of their report <laughs> is one of those national security mysteries I'll never quite fully understand. But, you know, Nancy can get a lot done in this town. Um, <laughs> our, uh, our panelists, uh, of course, are Nancy Berzel, who you've all met, uh, Shuja Nawaz, the director of the South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council uh, of the United States, who's uh, op-eds you read regularly and whose quotations you read frequently, including uh, in the New York Times and elsewhere. Uh, Michael Phelan, uh, the senior professional staff member at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and you work for Senator Luger, is that right? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, and Moeed uh, Youssef, the South Asia advisor at the U.S. Institute uh, of Peace. Um, so I wanted to just begin this with a few questions to sort of probe the premises of the report. And uh, I'm going to ask questions for a while, and then we look forward to opening this up uh, to all of you. Um, Nancy, let me start with you uh, and build on some of the comments that you uh, made at the beginning. Um, the report uh, notes that uh, in the two years since President Obama has come in and with a policy of trying far more engagement uh, with um, Pakistan and other nations, uh, and even in the aftermath of the um, Kerry uh, Luger uh, bill and many of the other programs that got started by the late Richard Holbrook, by Senator Clinton and all of that, if you go and you look at the approval ratings of the United States in polls in Pakistan, it's actually now not only, I think, at one of its historic lows, but significantly lower than it was when President Obama came into office. This has two significant political effects, it seems to me. One of them is that it makes people in Congress wonder uh, if this aid program that they have put a huge amount of political capital into passing uh, is resulting in even lower approval ratings. Was it the right idea to begin with? Uh, and the second question it raises, I think, in the, in the minds of Pakistanis is, is the U.S. Um, basically fundamentally uninterested in the development end of what they're doing. And I wanted to see if you could just give us your analysis after a year and a half of working on this report about why we are seeing this strange, mis strange mismatch of more focus on development and uh, declining uh, view of the U.S. Thank you very much, David. It's a good question. Um, well, I think there are a number of problems that could be addressed um, that I, I could mention in, in answering your question. The first is that I think that there's a general underestimation of the problem of the unintended consequences of announcing a big aid program and a lot of money attached to it um, without a sufficient focus on what the aid is supposed to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that is a little bit of the problem right now, is that expectations among, including very, um, you know, the elite in Pakistan, many of the academics, think tank folks, people in government, the expectations are very high, and they're thinking back, those of them that are over a certain age, to the 60s and 70s when the U.S. was very heavily engaged in long-term development programs in Pakistan, and so they're wanting a lot. So expectations are very high. And then married to that, the facts are not on the table for people in Pakistan. It's very hard to understand what is happening. And there have been some delays. Many could be justified um, over the last couple of years that's made things worse. So when people who have high expectations don't see either results right away or, and don't understand a vision, then in this world where there are the drone attacks, where there is suspicion um, on the farm, on other things that the U.S. is doing, the aid starts to seem like it's either a bribe to get the government to do something the government might not want to do, or in some cases it's because there's no transparency, it's feeding conspiracy theories, it's lining the pockets of the wrong people, 
it's going to um, the Army, it's going to uh, developing nuclear arms. So this is why we emphasize that that's the reality, that it, we're living in a difficult world, um, those of us who believe that you can do good, you can seed long-term development with aid, but to do so you have to do it with a lot of transparency and a lot of clarity about your vision over five or ten years. And otherwise, in a setting like Pakistan, aid will be seen as transactional, as instrumental, um, in the short run, a very short run sort of effort. Uh, well, the report uh, indicates at one point, uh, I think early on, I think Molly referred to this, that the three characteristics American aid needs is humility, clarity of mission, and patience. And these are not necessarily the three things the U.S. government is best known for uh, <laughs> over, over the many years. But uh, I think your answer has opened us up to a question for uh, Michael. Um, you worked at great length, of course, on Kerry Luger and on the civilian side of this. Uh, big as the number is, there's a bigger number out there for the amount that we spend in military, in reimbursements, in many other forms of, of aid to the military. Um, from your view on Capitol Hill, uh, do members of Congress, uh, including those who don't think about Pakistan each and every day, the way many people in this room do, do they understand the difference between the development side and the military side? And do they have a different view about whether or not the military funds should be used for political leverage versus the development funds being used for political leverage. Thank you, David. Uh, there are 435 members there, and many of them uh, fully understand, most of them fully understand the dynamics uh, of U.S. assistance, both military and uh, economic assistance. Um, they are grounded, many of them, in a traditional uh, approach to U.S. diplomacy and, and foreign policy and thus are informed by that uh, history. It's not easy to change uh, that dynamic, and I think Nancy, uh, in fact, uh, CDG has been pushing uh, to see some change in that, uh, especially along the development model. As she pointed out, Secretary Clinton has stated as, as much for the Obama administration that they were going to elevate uh, development as a tool. Uh, the reality is that uh, as any large ship takes some time to turn, uh, if the uh, helmsman is unwilling to turn the wheel, it's not going to turn at all, uh, however long it might take. Um, there are elements within our foreign service, within our development uh, organizations in the executive branch, within the military, that are comfortable with the way it is or the way it was and are going to put up some obstacles to changing that. And they have, in their view, good reason to hold to those uh, precepts. Uh, in Pakistan, the, uh, the difficulty of passing an authorization bill of such magnitude for one country uh, was not lost on those who were working on it for a couple of years through two administrations. And it is important to uh, uh, understand that great consideration was given to many of the elements before it was ultimately signed off on. But it also changed along the way. It was a much shorter document with a much, uh, I'd say, more flexible uh, 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 tool available for the uh, administration, whatever the administration uh, was in, in uh, taking advantage of it. And it ultimately ended up being something a bit more. And now some of us are looking back on it and saying, well, perhaps now it, it's not such a bad thing to have these certifications and a couple of extra uh, guiding elements within it. But Congress as a whole uh, needs to be continually uh, informed of the impact of our assistance overseas in a variety of circumstances in order to remain current with uh, uh, the opportunities that may be there. Right now, there's a pushback against assistance. Some are pushing back against security assistance. Some are pushing back against development, ec economic assistance. Uh, some want to wash their hands of, of it all together. Uh, and thus, you have to have a, an ongoing conversation. I think uh, Nancy's group helped that uh, uh, in, in, a, in a very big way. Michael, can I just push you on one point that you made? Um, Kerry Luger, as you say, has a number of certifications in it. Some of them, as you recall, raised big disputes in Pakistan. From 
people who objected to the uh, idea, particularly in the Pakistani parliament, that the U.S. would be, in their minds, interfering in their sovereign affairs by basically turning on and off the money with these certifications. Um, what's the future of those certifications? Uh, are you expecting, uh, they're nothing new in U.S.-Pakistani relations. We had them all through the era when the president had to certify that Pakistan was not building a nuclear weapon, which ended with Pakistan building a nuclear weapon. Um, so uh, I, I was wondering if you could tell me what you believe in the current environment um, the, the view of those certifications is going to be. Uh, let me use one of the uh, terms that Nancy's group selected, humility. I think that we have to realize our own law here in the United States is often worked around. There's a way to find a way to work around certain elements that are put in, into law. Uh, uh, lawyers make a killing uh, finding ways to work legally around things. Certifications in uh, foreign policy are tools to be used by the president. They're leveraged to be used uh, and can be uh, more restrictive. Uh, by interpretation or less restrictive by interpretation. Uh, I think that the, uh, your question goes to what's going to happen to the ones that are already in law. They're there. It's a matter of interpretation by the administration, of course, by Congress in calling them to task on whether or not they follow up in enforcing them. It is not intended to cut off funding. We were fully aware that the cutoff of funding uh, 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 to Pakistan would be detrimental, but it was also evident that Congress can do such a thing, and uh, for those who are clear-eyed, uh, they will do such a thing as they have in the past. So the tools remain available. It just uh, remains to the administration and the Congress to work out how they're going to be uh, uh, better utilized. Okay. Um, Malid, maybe you could turn to that portion of the report that discusses the need to have uh, American-provided uh, development assistance shock-proofed, I think is the word that the report used. Um, we've been in recent times through a lot of shocks in the U.S.-Pakistani relationship. I mean, in the past three months alone, the Raymond Davis case and, of course, the bin Laden uh, killing. Uh, before that, we went through um, the question of uh, Musharraf's transition to democracy. We went through AQ Khan, uh, all of which have been significant shocks to the system. Uh, first question for you is, is shockproofing possible? And second, how is it viewed inside Pakistan? Thanks. Thanks, David. And thanks, Nancy and Molly, for, for inviting me. Look, I think, David, the, the fundamental question after all these years remains on the table, um, which is, what is this aid for? If you're a U.S. policymaker, why are you giving Pakistan money? And I bet you if I were to ask this question to this room, you'll get at least five different answers. I get these in Washington all the time. You have more than five people in here. I think you'll have more than five answers. Well, like different that. answers. <laughs> but, you know, is it about stability and development in Pakistan? Is it about getting Pakistan to support the Afghanistan uh, war in a better manner? Is it about nuclear weapons? Is it, what, what do you ultimately want to achieve? Because it's the answer to this question which will define whether you can make it shock proof or not. Um, if the idea is that, well, this is aid, this is leverage to get something in return on the terrorism front, then I'm afraid you can't make it shock proof beyond a point. Um, if, if, you, if you finally decide, well, no, they're basically playing a double game to the point that it's counterproductive, then aid goes away. <laughs> if the realization is that aid is really for development, and Pakistan's long-term development remains in U.S. national security interest, then I think there's a case to be made that despite these shocks, the civilian aspect of the aid should not disappear, period. Well, does that argue then that you could establish a system in which the civilian aspect of the aid was shockproofed, but the military side of the aid was linked to a series of political goals, whether it's counterterrorism or support for Afghanistan or nonproliferation or right. whatever? I think partly that was the lens that was applied with the Kerry Luger bill in some ways. I mean, the, the idea was to broaden the relationship and not make civilian aid conditional uh, uh, beyond a point. Um, 
the problem again i think is you know if if i may explain it this way i think the idea was to do two things when this administration took over broader relationship with pakistan more money to to civilian um, administration and assistance and then doing something else strategically which is bringing in india trying to assuage pakistan's concerns of that end and that was what was going to leverage more support on afghanistan what happened was that that strategic part never took off and so we fell back on a classic problem we've had in this relationship for years which is that money the subtext for providing assistance was this question that we keep coming back to what are we getting in return mm-hmm. and my answer to that is you won't get anything in return if the idea is to change pakistan strategic mindset um and so i think the goal has to be absolutely clear the only thing you can get is a long term development outcome if usaid and others are asked to implement uh, development assistance keeping in mind development goals what we are doing right now is we are trying to get to short term stability goals we're losing the focus of development and as we all well know we are also not getting much response on the terrorism front from pakistan um mr nawaz if um mr yusuf is right and if in fact you won't get anything in return if the idea is to change pakistan's strategic outlook what does the us do does it give up any hope of changing that outlook or is there another form of leverage that you see that might work <coughs> again thank you to the organizers and nancy for including me um i think david in response to that question uh, i would go back to a promise that uh, president obama made in west point in 2009 when he addressed the people of pakistan and he said that the people pakistani people must know america will remain a strong supporter of pakistan security and prosperity long after the guns have fallen silent so that the great potential of its people can be unleashed um when you look at the the table uh, the chart that is in the report on page 18 you see a roller coaster historically and unfortunately that's been the pattern that's been repeated in the us pakistan relationship what the us and congress need to do is to to look long term and act long term and not be caught up by short term aims because uh, when you look at that particular chart you see one thing very clearly that the highest amounts of us assistance has come to pakistan when there's autocratic rule when there's a military or quasi military ruler in pakistan uh the the obama administration and the kerry luger bill was a sign that we were going to change that relationship the question now is are we going to stay that course this is what pakistanis are waiting to see otherwise it's it's going to confirm their worst fears that this is really talking long term acting short run and as soon as afghanistan is settled and particularly now that osama bin laden has been killed um declare victory and go home and leave the mess to pakistan again you know you mentioned the west point speech this was the december 1st speech that announced uh december 1st 2009 that announced the afghanistan and pakistan um strategy in that speech um president obama said very little about pakistan as you may recall and uh i think there's a a fair bit of reporting that indicates that the white house was thinking about saying more and actually said considerably less um but part of what did survive uh in the speech was a call for pakistan to get behind this counterterrorism strategy that was the key to the surge and there was an expectation set in the speech that Pakistan's cooperation would be reviewed when the rest of the Afghan surge is reviewed. Um that review is now upon us actually this month. Um when you think about how President Obama is going to uh look at this, um uh, what conclusions do you think he will come to and how do you think he will come down on the question of both the development aid and the military aid uh together? I see dark days ahead because uh if you go back to to 9/11 and 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 fast forward till till now uh not a single agreement was put down on paper between the United States and Pakistan. This is amazing on the military assistance program what were the objectives what were the benchmarks. 
Uh, and so even the CSF uh, was, was seen uh, by many in Pakistan as, as, as money up for grabs. Uh, and the U.S., of course, didn't demand any accountability for, for you, a while. You explain to the the to CSF is the Coalition Support Funds, which was money given to cash money given to Pakistan as reimbursement for the costs of moving its troops into the border region and fighting uh, what the U.S. thought would be the bad guys uh, operating out of Pakistan in Afghanistan. And of course, Pakistan ended up fighting a homegrown insurgency that resulted from moving the troops into the federally administered tribal area. So it created a, a complete new complication in that relationship, but nothing was ever put down in writing, neither between the intelligence agencies nor between the military. And so there are no benchmarks. I think it's very critical, even at this late stage, to retrieve the situation and say, look, we do away with the cash transfers. Let's agree on what Pakistan's needs are. Let's agree on what benchmarks we can mutually agree upon on the military as well as on the civil side. You make it your responsibility to monitor and review these flows, whether for civil or military, and we'll make it our policy to monitor and review. And if they mesh, then we can report to Congress and there's no trouble. And we are in for the long run, and the, 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 the proof will be in the eating. Great. Well, um, let's open the floor here to uh, some questions from all of you. And um, please, when you stand up, tell us who you are. And please actually make the question a question, uh, if you can. Sir. Uh, Taha Gaya with the Pakistani American Leadership Center. My question is for Mr. Phelan. Uh, we noticed that last session, uh, Senator Luger did introduce the Pakistani American Enterprise Fund, and I believe the CGD report calls for it uh, to go ahead forward. Uh, we spent a lot of time this session talking to uh, senators and members of Congress saying this is not new money, this would just be a new authorization on Kerry Luger Berman money. Is there a plan? Are there obstacles to that going forward? What is, what is the outlook on the Enterprise Fund? Because we also noticed that the Egyptian American and the Tunisian American Enterprise Funds got through, or were introduced at the very least. Remember what everybody's been saying about short term. Uh, dealing with the thing on the plate uh, now is Egypt and Tunisia. It's much easier to move things like that. Uh, there, it, it is under discussion on its reintroduction. Um, we've had an opportunity between then and now to take a closer look at how uh, former Eastern European countries dealt with it, uh, how we can improve this. We've looked at a Haiti uh, um, uh, opportunity as well as the uh, North African. So uh, it's still alive. There's discussion around it. Um, while the timing is questioned by some, um, um, there's still plenty of momentum, I think, behind it. And, and ultimately, if it's considered capable of bringing some of the change that is recommended to really being something more than a, a fig leaf, uh, it, it will likely be reintroduced. If I can leap in on that one for a moment, uh, during the Bush administration, when I was uh, still the White House correspondent, I remember Bush administration officials would say they could get anything for Pakistan. They could get, you know helicopters, airplanes, anything they wanted except a liberation uh, on the textile rules, okay, for the obvious uh, political reasons here. Uh, and the report is very clear that one of the biggest things that could be done for Pakistan right now is one that uh, requires no additional budgetary authority but would allow greater uh, imports. Is there any um, prospect of that? I noticed that the European Union uh, agreed to review there. It, it first looked like they had actually dropped some of their obstacles to trade, but they agreed to review it. The United States, I thought, well, this is a great opportunity for us to review it uh, as well. Um, that is, as you say, a political hot wire uh, for, uh, for us on the Hill, and it will require a great deal of heavy lifting and political capital, not only in Pakistan. This goes for anywhere we want to do something like this. The Africa Growth and Opportunity Act and ch making changes to that are the same thing. It's not specific to Pakistan. It shouldn't be uh, made to sound as though it's specific to Pakistan. And this goes for some of the requirements behind security assistance or any form of assistance. Pakistan is not a special case. We have these relations with many countries around the world, and there are expectations of this partnership that go in both directions. Dave, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you, but we have a whole panel on, on that issue. On the, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but not with Michael, so I oh, think it's okay. a good, that was a good moment to get Just his. Just very quickly, David, and, and sorry to 
to correct you uh, on what the Bush administration said it would, uh, it would be able to do. In terms of helicopters, in 10 years, Pakistan has received uh, helicopters in the low 20s. Uh, so that's really not a great record at, at having uh, provided Pakistan with what they needed to prosecute the war successfully. Uh, a, a good point. In the back corner here. It's a microphone coming to you. Hi, I'm Sebastian Abbott. I'm an AP reporter based in Islamabad. Um, you know, this question is for anyone who wants to tackle it on the panel. Um, one thing that had gotten a lot of focus before bin Laden and Raymond Davis kind of shook up the U.S.-Pakistan relationship in recent months was this question of how do you justify billions of dollars of aid to Pakistan when they're not actually taxing their own citizens? You know, the effective tax rate in Pakistan is about 10 percent. Effective tax rate in, uh, in the U.S. is closer to 30 percent. Uh, you know, wondering what you guys think about that. I mean, the reason the, the tax rate isn't raised in Pakistan is resistance from the political elite there who don't want to pay higher taxes. So, you know, whether it's in Congress or in the White House, how do you justify uh, spending billions of dollars when the Pakistanis could conceivably finance a lot of this themselves? Moe, do you want to uh, grab that uh, first and then, uh, Nancy? This is not a city on where the issue of uh, the, the sensitivity That's of raising the first tax thing rates to is, uh, <laughs> exactly. is new. Yeah. <laughs> Um, look, I, I, I think I won't get into the numbers and, and the reasons behind that. There may be some correction in order there. But, but the basic fact that tax reform is needed in Pakistan uh, is, is recognized across the board. And also the fact that it's really political obstacles in some ways which haven't allowed that to go through um, is, is, is fairly clear. So I think this point sitting in Washington that, you know, uh, I don't buy this argument we're giving so much money, why aren't they? But as a basic principle, the fact that they need their tax reform is fairly clear and there's absolutely no doubt about that. So that should happen for its own reason. But again, everything should not become a link to what we are doing. They're not doing X, why give the money? They're not doing Y, why give the money? The money is being given for U.S. national interest to my mind. It's not for only for the Pakistani interest. Otherwise, it would have ended a long time back. But I think I take your point about, about reform. Yeah, it's the same answer. Um, politics is hard to get right. We know that in Washington. And it's very tough on energy prices and energy taxes, which is the other big issue in Pakistan, and on taxes. We live with that every day here. We have our own gridlock. But the fundamental point is that the purpose of the aid to Pakistan is not primarily to bribe the elite in, or the, the, the government writ large to do something different. We know that that won't work. It, imagine if the, if the US were dependent on an IMF loan and the next tranche would not go through until we fixed our tax system and introduced a, a VAT, a consumption tax. I mean, what would Michael Phelan and people on the Hill have to say about that? So we have to keep in mind exactly what Moeed said. The point of our aid is to build up the civilian government to support the reformers in Pakistan who are trying to make the kinds of changes that we would like to see. If we think of it as leverage or as a bribe or as a reward for good behavior, it won't work. Young lady standing in the back there. There's a microphone coming to you. Hi, Mehreen Farooq from Word, the World Organization for Resource Development and Education. I want to congratulate you again on a great report. Um, we're actually uh, working on a project right now on uh, developing Pakistan civil society and sending a team there this summer. So I was wondering, based on your findings, um, how do you believe the U.S. can identify Pakistani organizations uh, that have the grassroots legitimacy and as well the credibility to counter radicalization? Uh, on the ground, particularly in the current threat environment and uh, considering all the restrictions that we currently have in place with a lot of the USAID employees in the country. Who wants to do this one? Uh, 
Marine, uh, let me see if I can respond. I think, first of all, there needs to be a very clear uh, decision on the part of the Pakistani authorities that this is indeed what they want to do. We don't seem to have the signals coming from uh, an extremely weak coalition government. Uh, it, it cannot uh, bring its coalition together to change the tax GDP ratio or to impose an agricultural tax or to make the state bank more independent. Uh, it's not going to be able to take on radicalization, which has been the outgrowth uh, of decades uh, of, uh, of a particular government approach uh, to the radicals. And it's been growing since the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. That's number one. Number two, I think um, we need to dissociate ourselves from trying to influence Pakistan to do these things. And that's really the basic issue. Pakistan has to find its own strength in civil society in particular. Uh, there are some signs of that, uh, but the security situation keeps forcing civil society uh, to, to hide uh, away. And the, the exodus of business leaders from Pakistan into Dubai, for instance, is not a good indicator. Uh, so there needs to be a much tighter focus and a very clear vision on the part of the government, which is shared with the people of Pakistan that this is what it's committed to. Once that commitment is there, support will come, not just from the U.S., but from other parts of the world, too. Um, David, could I sure. say a quick word on that? I think that, you know, I don't, I just, I agree completely with what Shuja said about leadership from the Pakistani government. But at the same time, I think that if you're in Pakistan, you, you feel something quite different from what you get from the headlines here. There are thousands and thousands of very active civic organizations there is a sophisticated middle class in urban areas, as you probably know, with really lots of people trying to accomplish exactly what you're talking about and what Shuja is referring to. And USAID has, in the last six months, begun to work more closely. They've beefed up their offices in Lahore and Karachi which are interacting more. There's a culture of philanthropy in Pakistan that I really hadn't been aware of in the past, which is very different from uh, Latin America or much of the rest of East, A of East Asia, for example. So I think there's a huge potential there. It is for, for the US to be helpful with small seed grants if we can avoid the sort of counter bureaucracy of everything has to be you know, for every $100,000 grant or $10,000 grant, there has to be audit reports and internal controls, and th this won't work. So we really do advocate that there be a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more risk-taking, you know, stop things after the fact, spend a little money, seed more groups, don't expect to spend a lot of money. It's a lot of work that relationship of the operational program to money that's spent would be higher. So these have to do, the things that I'm mentioning now have to do with changes that I believe can be made in the way the aid program is executed and organized. Um, we're down to a few minutes, so I'm going to take sort of two questions together if I can. Gentleman over here and gentleman right there, and then we'll parse these out. And if you can do them with Thank you. I'll try to keep it uh, succinct. Uh, my name is Elliot Tepper. I'm from Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, connected with Pakistan for a very long time. There was mention in passing on the panel that part of the strategic overview for the for, uh, United States and for Pakistan dealt with the India side of the equation, but somehow that didn't take off. That, uh, the U.S. working with India to help assuage Pakistan's concerns has not taken off. And I've not heard any further mention of it. Since this is a development-oriented panel, I would ask this question. Uh, if, with the drawdown of troops and the withdrawal of Western interest, uh, which is imminent uh, in the near future from Pakistan, why do we have any reason to believe that Pakistan won't fall back into the status quo ante, where the military commands a great deal of the budget, very little left over for development, uh, when they do not see any change in the global equation in their favor. That is, the India-Pakistan equation remains central to a solution 
of Afghanistan-Pakistan and U.S.-Pakistan relations. Okay, and the gentleman here, and we'll... Uh, hello, my name is I.J. Singh. I teach at the National War College. Uh, again, Nancy, thank you for having me here. Uh, I've now worked on South Asia for maybe 12 years, having brigadiers from India and Pakistan, South Asia as students. Uh, I want to congratulate you on what you're doing. So much of this needs to be done, and what you've done uh, is very, very, very important. Uh, knowing me, you'll know that this comes uh, from the heart. However, I must caution you. You cannot separate development aid from the overall strategic issues in Pakistan. Uh, we have many tools, uh, diplomatic, informational, covert, overt, uh, economic, legal, uh, which ought to be used in a coherent manner. One of the problems is they are not. So rather than separating development out, which would make it even more coherent, we need to think about how it can be coordinated with other things. Okay. The second thing I want to say is, you know, I agree wonderfully with the other point made here, it's not an APAC problem, it's an APAC in problem. And uh, the end, end state might be that the US will withdraw from Afghanistan close to 2014. We will then not have the leverage on our necks of Pakistan stopping the supply lines to Afghanistan. Uh, once that leverage is removed, aid can and should be separated. Because then we can say, here is aid, use it for this, right? And if you don't want it, you don't want it. Uh, now, it is very, very difficult because there's a mutual concern in Pakistan about the end state in Afghanistan and in the US about the current irritations that come from you know, how the Pakistan is fighting these wars and every time it wants to uh, do it, it closes our, our supply lines. So I think you cannot separate strategic issues in this sense from purely development issues. If I can uh, try to use the moderator's privilege to combine these together into one thought, what we've heard from both of our questioners is the concern that as the U.S. approaches whatever its withdrawal day 2014 would be at whatever level of forces are left then, that the Pakistani military sees, as I think you put it, nothing in its favor coming out of that situation. And therefore, it may be in Pakistan's interest, if I'm hearing the questions right, to basically sit on the status quo with the knowledge that they can go off in whatever direction they want. I may be interpreting that wrong. Malid? Yeah, let me take that. I, I, I heard the questions differently. I think I completely agree with the fact, I, I do a lot of work on scenarios, and there is no scenario for South Asia 2030 or 2040 where I can see a stable Pakistan without Pakistan India having normalized. It's as simple as that. Um, I also agree uh, with the fact that there is a problem that this AFPAC end is not there. The, the end part has to be there. Let me add, though, that I think this, this idea of, yes, the, the Pakistani military is peeved that it say, sees everything going against it at this point from its strategic mindset. But there are two important changes. One, the Pakistani military, more than ever, now depends on good economic, macroeconomic performance for its own budgets and survival. Um, and so it has an interest in, in actually seeing this through. Second, I think the internal challenges have caused somewhat of a rethink where the military is under pressure. They, this MFN business is now very much real. And there is a push from within Pakistan to, to look at trade with India as, as something that's going to open up. So I think the military is, is under pressure on this. There may be some give, but what comes out of that, I don't know. What I do know is that if it doesn't happen, I don't see any way Pakistan can stabilize. Let me add a sentence to that. I think in Elliot's point is well taken. Um, the, the biggest advantage to opening up with India is the income effect in both countries, India and Pakistan. So it's not a zero-sum game. If trade is opened up between India and Pakistan, then we, we might as well even forget the, uh, the, the textile quotas for Pakistan to come into the U.S. because they will be peanuts in comparison with what will result in the change in the trade between these two countries. 
as well as linking up South Asia with Afghanistan and Central Asia. The economic effects of that would be enormous, and they would help strengthen the civil vis-a-vis -vis the military over time. And I think that would achieve some of the goals that are inherent in many of the thinking and the legislation uh, that rattles around the halls of Congress. We have time for one more question. Right here. If you just wait a moment for a microphone. Thank you. My name is Sami Altaf. I've been involved with uh, uh, work for USAID for a long time, and I've been involved in the health sector development issues in Pakistan, and I'm part of the Wilson Center Working Group in Pakistan. My question is for Mr. Michael Fillon. In terms of the um, reaching the objective of uh, transparency and patience to help implement it, would this certification process be helpful? Can the certification process be used to um, get the government of Pakistan put its two on the table in terms of implementation and to get the other partners put their two on the table in terms of implementation in the field for the development programs? Would that be an instrument that can be used? One of the challenges that Nancy's group addresses is that the U.S. economic assistance team, the development uh, experts, need to determine best practices globally in concert with their uh, colleagues from other donor organizations, donor states, and in so doing, establishing some standard. Um, establishing a standard from a U.S. perspective in Pakistan will be open to plenty of uh, criticism from others who think it's the wrong standard, there's a better standard, and so forth. Uh, a certification, I think, would better be applied um, in the bilateral, uh, uh, more strategic issues. But having an expectation, because this Kerry Luger uh, enhanced partnership with Pakistan legislation was intended to be just that, a partnership. And one of the reasons we're not as upset that the money isn't flowing out the door at a great rate is because we had hoped that the foundation would be established prior to that opening of the coffers to deliver, that the Pakistani institutions were prepared, uh, both the NGO community and the government, and that the U.S. institutions there, the U.S. aid mission and, and the consulates, were in a position to effectively implement and monitor and adjust those programs. So yes, I, I think there should be some measure that's a minimum standard that, uh, that uh, the uh, donor and host country agree upon, and then upon achieving that standard, move ahead. Yeah. I, I'm not sure what you mean by certification in this context, or even what Michael means, but I would like to say that what we recommend in the report is not that there be some standard, some benchmarks which, if not met, then aid ends. We know that that doesn't work in the donor community. The World Bank discovered it. Conditionality hasn't worked of that kind. What we do recommend is that there be a search for what is working already, even if other donors are doing it, and that those programs be supported. That U.S. money built, reinforce what's working already. And we know some programs are working already. And we also recommend that there be more tolerance for trial and error. And most fundamentally, that there be transparency, even when things don't work, and adjustment, so that both Pakistanis who are trying to get things right there are many, many capable people, as you probably know, at the federal level and in provincial governments. They're, they may not be a majority at any one moment. They're working in very difficult environments. But many of them are succeeding. So the key is to find them and support them. And when things don't go quite right, to step back and make adjustments. And that requires building up, I think, a lot of tolerance on the Hill, in the State Department, and it's a kind of uh, having some patience, as Molly said in her introduction, about development, because it, it is a bumpy road. It doesn't always go along 
perfectly well. But it's a d definitely the kind of investment that has lower risks than military interventions uh, and lower costs. And as long and, and here I want to just say a quick word on some of the issues raised around India and whether cohesiveness matters and coherence, strategy, you know, diplomacy, defense, security, development. I think the distinction has to be made constantly between short term and long term. And development is the area where, where you have to think long term with patience. That's the distinction, not in the overall objective of building a capable, supporting Pakistanis in building their own capable, responsive 